Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, evening recording. This isn't a uh, live stream, but uh, we're just recording it uh, and I trust that it'll be helpful uh, for all of you. Welcome uh, to those of CHBC and also a special welcome to anyone else uh, who might be tuning in. Uh, I hope and trust, uh, we as a church hope and trust that uh, God's word uh, would speak uh, very powerfully to you uh, at this time. So uh, without any, anything further, uh, can you open up your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 13? Uh, Genesis chapter 13, uh, if you pull out a phone or something, uh, just so that you can follow along. Genesis chapter 13, and we are going to read the chapter uh, before we jump in. So... Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. So Abraham, uh, Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's blessing uh, upon the preaching of, of his word in our time now. Our Father, we come before you through our Lord Jesus Christ, and what a privilege it is to call upon you, even as Abram called upon you. And we call upon you this evening. Uh, Father, our hearts are grieved and troubled uh, and sorrowful at the fact that we cannot meet together. Uh, the day that you have set aside for us to gather as a family of God and to offer up worship that is different to the rest of our week, uh, worship that isn't just individual, but that is corporate, and we can't do it at the moment. You know, Lord, and you know the wisdom that we need in dealing with times such as these. But you are still on the throne, and so we come to you, and now in this brief time that we have, we come and submit to your word, and we want to hear from you. We pray for the precious ministry of the Holy Spirit to bring illumination to your word. This world is very dark. May you bring light to us through your word. We pray that we may see wonderful things in it. We pray you would challenge, you would confront us with your truth and that you would speak to where we are at and what you would have us to hear. 
I pray that you would show us even something of Christ at this time. For we are only saved because of him and everything is about him. So please meet with us in these unique circumstances. We offer up our worship to you through listening now. And we pray that it will result in obedience. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the most common Christian phrases that is just well known from those outside and inside the church is that uh, is the phrase walking by faith and not by sight. Uh, this is virtually the rule of the kingdom for the Christian that we are to walk by faith. But has that phrase uh, become nothing really more than just a Christian cliche or a Christian hallmark card. What does it mean? What does it mean to walk by faith? Uh, do we walk by faith? Do you walk by faith? Could it be said of you? Is it something that you think about? Is it something that you practice? I, I'm, I'm convinced that this phrase, this principle, this rule of the kingdom to walk by faith is far bigger than we often think. And I fear that uh, for too many of us, and including myself at times, this become, has become nothing more than a phrase. And we don't actually live it out. It's not a reality of our lives. So uh, during our time now, we have an example before us, a living example, uh, a recorded example of someone who walked by faith so that we can see really what it is. Uh, but before we jump into the text, just, just the context of what's going on here. We're in chapter 13, but in chapter 12 is Abram's calling. Now, throughout the sermon, I might accidentally say Abraham, uh, to just be a force of habit. But at this point, he's still Abram. The Lord calls Abram and tells him to leave, uh, leave all his household, as it were, leave all of his, uh, his land that he was dwelling in, the city that he was, and he calls him to be a pilgrim. In, in chapter 12, then, he, he starts making his pilgrimage to where the Lord has called him. He builds an altar to the Lord. He calls on the Lord, it says. And God gives him this great promise that he is going to give him the land of Canaan. He is going to give him all this land to his descendants. This is a great promise that the Lord gives to him. But then as the chapter moves on, there's famine in the land and he needs to take refuge in Egypt. And the famine uh, gets very strong. He takes refuge in, in uh, Egypt and his faith is put on trial. And he puts aside faith to lean on sight. And he's dishonest. He doesn't trust the Lord. And he's dishonest to Pharaoh at the time. We'll look at that uh, briefly. But then from there, we, we launch into our passage. Look at chapter 13. The first point uh, that I want us to consider tonight is that the life of faith is marked by repentance. The life of faith is marked by repentance. Look at Verses 1 to 2, and we'll move through this section. So Abram went uh, up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham, Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Now, Abram has been forced out of Egypt because he tricked Pharaoh. He didn't trust God. And he thought that Pharaoh was going to kill him because his wife was so beautiful. So get rid of Abram to have Sarai, his wife. And so Abram says, tell Pharaoh, he says to his wife, tell Pharaoh that you're my sister and then my life will be spared. And he does that. The plan works. Pharaoh takes Sarai to be part of one of his wives. And the Lord begins to inflict diseases upon Pharaoh. And Pharaoh finds out the truth and says, How could you do this to me? How could you lie to me like this? How could you bring such trouble upon me? Now get out. Get out and leave. And Abram, the man of faith, is rebuked by a man who has no faith in God, by Pharaoh. It's a terrible account. But now in these opening verses, as Abram leaves Egypt, he's cast out. The author, the Holy Spirit here, through Moses, says that he makes specific mention of Abram's wealth. It says, Abram, 
Abram had become very wealthy. Now, this becomes a, a key theme throughout the passage, that Abram became very wealthy and he had great wealth. He had wealth in Haran when he was still there, as the Lord was calling him. But he's, he recently uh, gained a whole lot more wealth. Uh, a great abundance of wealth has just fallen on his lap. Look what happened in 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 16. Pharaoh treated Abram well for Sarai's sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maidservants, and camels. So his time in Egypt seemed to be worth it because he receives all of this wealth from Pharaoh. And so it seems like his time there was well worth it from a worldly perspective. But Abram sees that experience differently. He has a different perspective. Look at verses 3 to 4. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, this is very surprising Abram, out of all the land, he chooses to go back, all the way back to Bethel. The whole land is before him. Why does he go back to Bethel? Why does he choose that? He's already left that place. Why does he go back? Well, the author doesn't give us uh, some, not, uh, some subtle hints. He is very clear why. Verse 3, Abram goes back to the place where his tent had been at the beginning that's how it should be uh, accurately translated there, where his tent was at the beginning. And then in verse 4, it says, He went where he first built the altar. Do you see the emphasis there? He went back to the beginning. He went back to the place uh, uh, where he was at first, first and beginning. What's he doing there? It says there, he called on the name of the Lord. What's going on? Do you see the emphasis here? In Egypt, he greatly sinned. He lost faith. He put trust in himself upon his own wisdom. And now he goes back. Now he goes back to Bethel. He goes back to where he started, seeking forgiveness, seeking renewal, seeking cleansing, as it were. He goes back to the place where he first called on the name of the Lord, where he declared Yahweh to be his God. He goes back to the place where he committed himself to following Yahweh. The author says he went back to where he was at the beginning, the place at first. And it's as if he wants to start again. It's as if it's a fresh start to renew his faith and trust in God. Baldwin, let me quote him. He says something wonderful here. Quote, It is important to notice that he came back and that the way was open for him to come back and that the Lord received him back as the continuing story proves. End quote. He comes back and the Lord enables him to come back for this fresh start and renewal. I want to ask you, I, 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 again, I don't know who's watching at this time. I do not know who's listening. I don't know where you're at. But I ask you, are you in a place, have you found yourself in a place where you have strayed from God? Where you have slowly walked away? You are not where you were when you first called upon the Lord, where you first trusted Him. You're not living the same. You begin to distrust Him. You're growing cold towards Him. You've been leaning more on your own planning and wisdom. You're starting to do things according to the way you think they should be done. And that deep faith, that dependent faith, isn't evident anymore. If that's you, it's not too late today to go back. It's not too late. If you have breath in your lungs at this moment, it's not too late to go back, to go back to the start, to again, to renew your faith, to repent, to acknowledge your sin and distrust, to go back, to call upon the name of the Lord and to have your faith renewed, to renew your trust and allegiance to Him again. Abram's faith. His walking by faith was evidenced now by and marked by repentance. Come back. Come back to Christ. 
come back to Christ. Our Bethel is Calvary, where we saw him, where we first came to love him, where the burden of our sin was taken away, where he put an end to it, and where he saved us and rescued us. You need to come back. Come back to Christ and renew your trust and allegiance to him, calling upon the Lord as Abram did. The life of faith is marked by repentance. Secondly, I want us to see the life of faith cannot avoid trials. The life of faith cannot avoid trials. Now, it's important to see here as, we, as we're about to jump into verses 5 following that Abram's new wealth didn't, didn't corrupt him. It didn't corrupt him. He gains all of these wealth and possessions in Egypt and yet... Straight afterwards, he repents of his distrust. He, he repents of leaning on his own wisdom and he renews his faith in God. And so this newly acquired wealth, it didn't grab Abram's heart. He was not gripped by it. However, this new acquainted wealth, newly acquainted wealth, it brought trouble and it led to strife. Look at verse 5. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. Now, just stop there for a second. Abram wasn't the only one who became greatly rich because of Egypt. It says also that Lot became wealthy through his stay in Egypt with Abram. It says that he had flocks and herds and tents. This is all in the plural, multiple amounts of these. He had to have his own herdsmen and shepherds to look after all the livestock and flocks that he had gained. Both became very wealthy in servants and livestock in possessions. And yet the wealth had a way of bringing great difficulty into their lives. You know that famous saying, more money, more problems. Look at verses 6 to 7. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. What's going on here? Their possessions have accumulated so much. They've got so much now that the land that they're in here, Bethel, it couldn't sustain both of them. There wasn't enough water for all of their flocks and herds combined. There wasn't enough pasture for all of their flocks and herds combined. And what was the result? Lot's herdsmen began fighting and quarreling with Abram's herdsmen. Who got the water? Who got the pasture? They were both making sure that their livestock were getting well fed and well treated. Why why couldn't the land support both of them? What's going on? Well, There's just a bit of insight here at the end of verse 7. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So much of the land at this point is being occupied by other people, other cultures, other groups, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And so the room that they do have where they are staying is not enough for both of them. It's not enough. And so the fighting begins The fighting and the quarreling, the strife, the trouble begins. Isn't it interesting that prior to Egypt, the account, even in chapter 12, shows us that Abram and Lot were able to travel together with the possessions that they did have. Prior to Egypt, their possessions were fewer. There were fewer, so land was never an issue for them. They were able to travel far and wide. They traveled high and low. They traveled miles and miles through the Negev even to get to Egypt, and it was never a problem. And yet now it would be possessions that would cause them to have to part ways and bring trouble into their lives. The Holy Spirit here in this text makes it clear, the author is making it clear that there is no trouble. There was no trouble in the families before this. Trouble only came as a result of these increased possessions that were brought in into their lives. Now, I need to make a, a state of clarification here, a statement of clarification. Money and wealth is not sinful. 
It is not sinful. Rather, the scriptures say the pursuit and the goal of money and possessions and wealth, the pursuit of it and hoarding it and and going after it, that is sinful and that is dangerous. In one in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, Many who have gone down that path have pierced themselves with many sorrows. It brings great trouble. But here we see the life of faith, living and walking by faith, does not prevent us from facing trials and difficulty for our faith to be tested. Think about it even in Jesus' life even regarding his faith and trust in his Father. Think about Jesus' baptism. He's baptized, and the Father opens the heavens and speaks from heaven. This is my beloved Son. My beloved Son, listen to him. The Father affirms his love for the Son, and the Father gives a precious gift to the Son. The Father anoints the Son with the Holy Spirit, who comes down like a dove and rests upon him. Wow, how strong, how encouraged would Christ have been? The very next verses say, and then the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Immediately, his trust and confidence in his Father and reliance upon the power of the Spirit to do his ministry immediately was placed under great testing and under great pressure. And this is what we see with Abram. Think about this. God has promised in chapter 12 to give Abram all the land, all the land. Now, what's happened so far? Abram ventures into the land, and what does he experience? The whole land is in famine. He has to leave this wonderful land that's in famine to go to Egypt just so that he can survive. After his stay in Egypt, he goes back into this land that God has promised him. And he finds that it's occupied by all of these other peoples, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. On top of that, he finds out the portion that he can stay in at the moment doesn't even have enough room and doesn't have enough resources to support him and his family. And the land brings trouble to him and his family. His faith is tested. His faith is under pressure. Walking by faith is hard because the circumstances are against him. Walking by faith doesn't mean the avoidance of trials. Next, I want us to see that the life of faith is marked by contentment. The life of faith is marked by contentment. So Abram has renewed his faith. The promise that God gave him hasn't been fulfilled yet. And there's trouble and strife in his family. So what's, what's to be done? What is to be done We need to see how Abram takes the initiative now in dealing with this trial. Look at verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. The Hebrew there for uh, translation here says um, quarreling. The Hebrew is let there be no no strife. what's What's Abram's plea and concern? What is it? What's his concern that he expresses here? Let not material possessions, let not wealth come between us. May we not be torn apart by mere material things. We're flesh and blood. And shall we let these temporal things come between us? And dear listener, isn't this the all too common experience throughout every generation? Think about it. You know it. You've seen it. How many families, how many families have been ruined over the issue of money and wealth? How many sibling, siblings have gone to war against each other over inheritances and wills? How many marriages have been severed and decimated because of spendings, loans, and debts? And Abram says here, may that never be of us. May possessions never tear us apart. May we never fight over it. Do you see what he says in verse 8? Did you see that little phrase at the end there? For we are brothers. We are kinsmen. We know this biologically, that uh, Lot was Abram's nephew. 
He, Abram was the uncle of Lot. They were family biologically. He says, but we are brothers. But they were also brothers in a, another sense. They were brothers in the faith too. Both of them have, had taken Yahweh to be their God. Both of them, not just Abram, because 2 Peter chapter 2 says that Lot was a man of righteousness who had believed in God as well. And Abram's saying, how can we let quarreling and strife come between us? He takes the initiative to, to deal with this and say, how can we let this happen? And strife and quarreling, strife and trouble would be a common theme in the family of Abraham in the present and for generations to come. Think about his wife Sarai with her strife with Hagar. And as uh, Abram had kids, think about the strife that would come between Jacob and Esau. And then furthermore, Abram's descendants, think about the strife and quarreling that they would have with God in the wilderness. They grumbled and complained and had strife with God saying, we want water. And God gives them water, but he calls a place Meribah, which means place of quarreling, place of strife. It is, a, it is an all too common sin that we give into. And it permeates churches today, doesn't it? It permeates church divisions and fighting and people taking side all because of preferences, all because we don't get our own way, all because we think our rights are violated, all because we are strong-willed and we want what we want. And strife and quarreling happens in the household of God. Remember, James had to deal with this in his letter in the New Testament, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, James says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. This broke out between Lot's servants and Abram's servants. But Abram would have none of it. He would have none of it, this man of faith. And so what does he do? Firstly, he takes the initiative we saw. He, he, he goes up to deal with it. But look how, he, look how he actually deals with it. The action that he takes through contentment, through contentment, he lovingly offers Lot a gracious proposal. Look at verse 9. Abram said to Lot, Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. Now, the region east of Bethel couldn't, couldn't su support them both, and so they needed to part ways. Abram says, We'll need to part ways because we can't both stay here. But who gets what region? If they're going to have to go to different places, who gets what? And as you read later on in the story, one particular region, one area was far more fruitful and beautiful and pleasing than the other region. So the question is, who gets what? Who gets what part? Abram with contentment. He gives Lot first dibs, gives him first choice. Gives him the priority pick. He says there in the verse, the whole land is before you. If you go to the left, I go right. If you go right, I'll go left. And, and this, should, this statement, this should surprise us. Abram is the uncle. He is the leader of the family clan. Lot is only privileged to come alongside Abram and, and through this journey because Abram's allowed him to come along. Lot's getting all the blessings because of Abram. And yet, he gives up. Abram gives up first choice, the priority choice to his nephew. Now, this is remarkable. I want you to think about this. Say, for example, to kind of put this in, in a context that we could relate to. Say an inheritance falls to, uh, falls to you and another relative. Now, what, what, what is allocated to you guys is uh, two properties, 
two, two properties. Now, one of these properties is a house on the beachfront with an ocean view in an incredibly wealthy area. That's one of them. One of you gets to live there. The other property is a run-down shack in a poor area in the ghetto. Now, you must decide who gets to live in which place. Who, who gets which place? One is for one and the other is for the other. And then you make the decision. You say to your relative, I'll let you choose first. I'll let you choose first. Whatever one you choose, I'll have the other. It's incredible. What Abram does here is absolutely incredible. It's absolutely amazing what he offers to Lot. To read it is astounding. And yet it's incredibly difficult to read, isn't it? It's incredibly uncomfortable to read. Because when we look at it, it's not like looking in the mirror. We are guilty. We are guilty. We are guilty of putting ourselves first. Of doing and taking care of ourselves and meeting our needs first. Putting self first. And we see this, don't we? We're seeing it again at the supermarkets. It's happening all over again. The panic buying. When trouble comes, what do we see? Everyone looking out for themselves. People are raiding the, shop, uh, uh, the shelves. They're stocking up their shopping trolleys with things they don't need. And we look at that and we think, how could people be so selfish? How could they be so self-centered? How could they do that? I want to know why we're surprised by that. That is natural. That is a natural human fallen condition. That is natural. And we look and we're disgusted and we think, how could people do that? But I think the reason deep down why we're so angry is because when we see the empty shelves and people taking them away, taking them away we are angered because we believe that those products should be in our trolley. And we want them in our trolley and in our pantries. Because we naturally look after self first. We naturally think of self before others. And we're guilty of this. But Abram, he displays this surprising, this otherworldly kind of contentment. This beautiful contentment. He's not after the nicest things. He's not after the best. He's not after the most. He's not after wealth and he willingly forfeits. He willingly forfeits the best because he is content. He is content. What's going on? He is just at Bethel, built that altar, called on the name of the Lord. He has just enjoyed sweet communion with God. Who cares about real estate? Who cares about land when you have God? That stuff doesn't matter. What does the hymn tell us? When our focus is heavenward and Godward, what happens? The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Abram's been with God. He's looking unto God, and the things of earth are dim. He's a man of contentment to go without, to forfeit the best of what this world has to offer, to leave it. Is grounded, his contentment is grounded in his faith. Abram was content because he walked by faith. Hebrew, Hebrews 11 verse 9 is the commentary on this. Hebrews 11 9 says this, by faith, Abram made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Such people were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. He was content because he walked by faith in God and what was to come. Alexander McLaren says, says this wonderfully. Let me quote him. It does not matter what accommodation we have on the boat when the voyage is so short. End quote. 
Do you see what he's saying here? Who cares about first class? Who cares about business class when the trip is so short? Our journey to heaven, our stay here on earth, we are but a vapor. We are a mist. It's so quick. And so we walk by faith and we can be content because this life is only short. Dear listener, do you walk by faith? When you say, yes, is it marked by contentment, evidenced by contentment? Nathan, are you content? Do you walk by faith? And are you, set, are you settled with what God has installed for you? So Abram here brings peace to this family dispute through his contentment and through his selflessness. He brings peace where there was strife. What did our Lord Jesus Christ say on the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Abram had become like his God. He had become like his God. And that line in verse 9 is so Wonderful. Verse 9, he says to Lot, Is not the whole land before you? That is beautiful. That, that is stunning on a whole new level. Why is that? Because God promised all the land to Abram. He promised it to Abram. And then Abram says to Lot, Is not all the land before you? To bring peace. He surrenders his rights, his privileges, his entitlement. He surrenders that and lovingly offers Lot the best choice. Is Abram not a picture? Is he not a picture of Emmanuel? Does he not prefigure the God who became a man, who surrendered his rights? Philippians 2, though he was in very nature God, he left his throne of glory. He surrendered his privileges and his rights. And he took on flesh to become a man. And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Though he's, Jesus said, I could have called upon angels to rescue me. But he doesn't. He takes on flesh. He surrenders his right. And he dies upon a Christ. What on a cross. Why? To bring peace. To bring peace between enemies, between God and men. He has reconciled us with God. He died in our place. The Lord Jesus Christ. The picture, the great picture of contentment. What does it say in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 following? The Lord Jesus, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He was content and he endured it. Walking by faith is marked by contentment. It is marked by contentment. Next point that we see, we see the temptation to walk by sight. We see the temptation to walk by sight. Lot is offered first choice here, it says. And look what happens, verses 10 to 11. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain uh, of, of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. See in verse 11 there, it says, And Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan. Now, that is no incidental detail. He is the nephew of Abram. He is inferior to, in status toward Abram. So when Lot was given this choice, he should have said, Abram, uncle, the honor is too great. The honor goes to you. Thank you, but no, you choose first. You choose first. He doesn't do that. He chose for himself. He pounces upon Abram's generous offer and gracious offer. And he goes against what was rightful and honorable. He didn't do the right thing. Why not? Why didn't he do the right thing by his uncle? Because when he surveyed the land, his eyes stumbled across a portion that was the closest thing to heaven on earth. Literally, literally, the closest thing to heaven on earth. 
What do I mean by that? What does the text say? He saw that the whole plain was well watered like the garden of the Lord. He sees a portion of land that was like Eden, so well watered, so lush. In Genesis chapter 2, when it describes Eden, it says a river flowed through it that watered the entire garden. So it was fruitful and green and beautiful. And, and Lot, he sees an area that is well watered like the Garden of Eden. It's lush. It's fruitful. It's a dream come true. What's going on here? Where, where did Lot just come from? Lot had just experienced famine. And he just sought retreat in Egypt with Abram. He'd experienced famine. He'd experienced barrenness. And now he sees luxury. Now he sees prosperity. Now he sees the good life and he wants to seize it. He wants all of it for himself. For himself. The good life, he's attracted and drawn to it. Before Lot, he sees the regions on one side. There is barren land of just hills. And on the other, other side, he sees this paradise, a well-watered, region, plenty of pasture, plenty of water for his herds, security and prosperity. He has these two options. And notice how the Holy Spirit emphasizes what Lot saw. And he's seeing, there's a real emphasis here. It says in the text you see it in verse 10, he looked up and he saw that it was like Eden, that it was like Egypt. What's going on here? The seeing influences his decision. Lot ends up walking by sight. He chooses based on sight. But there's a problem here. There's a problem when you walk by sight. The Holy Spirit in this passage reveals, through the author here, reveals, unfortunately, what Lot didn't see. What didn't he see? Did you notice it there? It's tucked away. What didn't Lot see amidst all of the beauty? He didn't see verse 10, the end of verse 10, that this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he didn't see verse 13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. He doesn't see these things. He just sees the beauty. It all looks so good. It all looks so promising. But guess what? The well-watered region, all the grass, all the pasture, it was only hiding a truth that was about to be a reality, that all of that land was about to be burned with fire and become nothing more than rubble. See, his eyes only showed him half of the picture. His eyes couldn't see. He did not see that he was walking into Death Valley. Walking by sight does that. You see, he thinks that he's won big time with this choice. He thinks he's won big time. But the reader of Genesis knows that in chapter 19, Lot loses. He loses. He doesn't win. He doesn't just lose a contest. He doesn't just lose a good decision or, or an opportunity. He loses everything. Everything. He lo when the city is burned with fire by God in judgment, he loses all of his possession, all of those herds and livestock. Everything that he owns is destroyed. He loses his wife. She is destroyed. He loses his sons-in-law. They are destroyed. He loses his dignity, his children, his daughters get him drunk and rape him. He loses. He loses everything. You see, Lot sees the prosperity, but he does not see the outcome. He does not see the outcome of his choice. What else does Lot not see? His eyes do not show him the power of temptation. What do I mean by that? Well, in verse 12, look what it says. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. So in verse 12, he only goes close to Sodom. And as he learns about its wickedness, 
He doesn't realize the power of the temptation because in chapter 14, verse 12, it tells us that he's actually living in Sodom. So he's moved from going near Sodom to near to Sodom to moving into Sodom and living there. And when you get to chapter 19, you find that his whole life is there. He has a family there and his daughters are even pledged to get married there. He is well settled. How did he get there? How did he get there to that point? He looked, he saw, he chose. He chose based on sight. Genesis has already shown us. Genesis has already shown us that walking by sight is extremely dangerous. You remember Eve? She was forbidden to eat the fruit. She was tempted by Satan. And then what does it say in chapter 3, verse 6? Listen to the wording. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate from it. She saw that it was pleasing. She saw the prosperity, the goodness of it. But what didn't she see? She didn't see the outcome of that deed. She didn't see the misery that would follow, the destruction, the devastation, the consequences that would follow by acting on sight. And the same is, exact, is exactly with Lot here. Did you notice the three verbs? The Holy Spirit in writing this for us is so clear. The three verbs. He looked up, he saw, and he chose for himself. And, and understand this choice that he made based on sight would be the biggest mistake of his life. The biggest mistake of his life. If you are listening This is showing us, please do not miss this. This is showing us the blinding power of greed and covetousness. This is showing us the wage for walking by sight. Do not, do not go down this path. When you look out at this world, when you look at your circumstances and you look at what the world has to offer, you think that you are seeing happiness. You, are th- you think that you're seeing a world full of wonderful things. You think that it is right. You think it will be bringing fulfillment. You think that it will satisfy you, but it won't. Understand, please do, n- do, do not misunderstand this. Our eyes cannot be trusted. They cannot be trusted. They are false guides. They are not reliable. They do not show us everything. They show us only half of the picture. Sight can only give us half of the picture. What does Proverbs 14, 12 warn us of? There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. Our eyes cannot be trusted. It is a dangerous and deadly, foolish errand to walk by sight. It really is. And our culture deems walking by faith as foolish. You're living for things that you cannot see. Faith is blind. What are you doing? Live for the now. Live for what you can see. Suck the juice out of life. Gain. Can't you see it all before you? And yet they prove to be the foolish ones. Those who walk by sight are always chasing things. They are always looking for more. Why? Because they're never satisfied. They are empty vessels. They cannot be filled. They're miserable. They're depressed. And they're hopeless. People who walk by sight often make decisions without asking very, very important questions. They walk by sight And they do not ask important questions. Questions such as, will this choice wound my conscience? Will this decision greatly affect my soul? How will this decision and this act and this pursuit affect my marriage and my family? How will this decision affect public worship? Will I have to leave a good church because of this thing that seems so good and a great opportunity? Will it prevent me from being generous? Will it prevent me from serving God? Walking by sight is a dangerous game and it is a dangerous temptation. Well, let's look at our last point very quickly. Our last point. The life of faith is marked by patient trust. Don't miss this. Think about how Abram would have been feeling at this point. 
He's had to part ways with his family member, Lot. He's probably grieved by Lot's selfish choice. And on top of that, God's promises appear to be failing. Abram appears to be the loser in this situation. God's promised him the land. He goes into the land. It's full of famine. He goes back to the land. The Canaanites and Perizzites are occupying most of it. He goes back to the land and there's not enough room for him and his family. And you see, on top of that, it seems that, it seems that Lot gets the most fruitful region while Abram's left to the hills. It seems really, when you look at this, Maybe Abraham, Abraham might be thinking that he threw away a golden ticket here. He threw away a great opportunity. Was, would this be a choice that he immediately regrets? Well, God doesn't allow him to think like that because look at God. Look what God does. Verse 14. Then the Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted with him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. You see this? God brings immediate comfort immediate reassurance. God reaffirms His promises. He reaffirms that faith is the right path. And it says, immediately after Lot left, the Lord spoke to Abram. The timing is perfect. Lot goes, God confirms. God's word does this. God's word does this. It comes at the right time. It's what we need. And God gives Abram, reaffirms these two great promises. I'm going to give you all the land. And by God reaffirming that, it's wonderful. Because Abram gave up the best part of the land. And God says, All of it's going to be yours. All of it's going to be for your descendants. You haven't lost anything. You haven't given up anything. And the second great promise is to this fatherless man, this aged fatherless man, your descendants are going to be as much as the dust particles of the earth. Cannot be counted. So numerous. Now, it may shock the reader. It may shock us. But Hebrews 11.13 actually says this, Abram died not receiving these promises. Isn't that incredible? Abram dies not getting these promises fulfilled to him. What's going on here? Is God not trustworthy? Does God let him down? Does God change his mind? Does God not follow through? Well, these promises had a present and a not yet aspect to them. The fulfillment would be much later at the end. All his descendants would be given the land. All his descendants would be brought in. They would inherit the promised land. It had a great future fulfillment. But understand, we as Christians are in the same boat. We have wonderful and great promises. We are redeemed. And yet Romans 8 says we still await the redemption of our bodies. We're partially redeemed. We, we wait for the time when these bodies will become sinless, when we won't sin anymore. And so we also must have a, faith, a patient faith, patient trust. But there is great encouragement because our waiting is not without foretastes. Our waiting is not without foretaste of these promises. Look at verse 17. God said to him, Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. God is wanting Abram to go and inspect all the land. Go for a tour. Go take it in. Go and look. Go check every part of it. It's all going to be yours. Feel the grass underneath your feet. Go and have a look. Have a foretaste of it. Why is God doing this? Abraham has to wait. He has to be patient and trust in faith. But God graciously wants to give him a foretaste until the fulfillment comes. And God does this for Christians as we wait on his precious promises to be fulfilled. He gives us these foretastes. You know, there is a great day that is waiting for us in the future. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 8. 11, this great day. Many will come from east and west to recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What a day that will be. But don't we get a foretaste of it even now? 
Is not that time when we come and gather together around the Lord's table for communion? Isn't that a great foretaste of that incredible future event around the Lord's table with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Or what about in Revelation, in chapter 7, verse 9, it says that there is this multitude that is innumerable of people from every nation, every ethnicity before the throne of God, and they're all worshipping God and praising the Lamb. Don't we get a foretaste of that even now? Are not our local church gatherings, our services, aren't they a foretaste where we see people from every ethnicity coming, worshipping and praising the Lamb? That's why we grieve during lockdown. Because the foretaste is taken away from us. Look at Abram's response. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. And so the narrative ends how it began. The narrative opened with Abram building an altar and worshipping God. The narrative closes with Abram building an altar and worshipping God. See, in a pagan land full of idols, Abram unashamedly confesses the one true God. Worship unashamed. Let me close. Abram hasn't received the promise, and yet he repents of his distrust. We see him embrace trials. We see him worship despite what his eyes see around him. And we see him content, even though it seems he is giving up the best that this life has to offer What do we see? We see him walking by faith. We find it so hard to trust God, to depend on God, and to lean in on God and to worship him when our circumstances are tough. We find it so hard to be content in this life when there are so many things that sparkle and self-denial seems so foolish. Contentment seems so hard. But despite what you see happening, despite the lure and the pull of all of these things, We are called to walk by faith and trust in our God to live this way, to be marked by these things. And so how do we do this? We must go back like Abraham. Calvary is our Bethel. That's where we go. That's where we are renewed. That's where we are strengthened. That's where the things of earth grow strangely dim when we behold Christ, what He has done for us. And because of what He's done for us, it shows us where we're going. We're going to be with Him very soon where we will live in His presence forever. Walking by faith is not a Christian cliche. It is the rule of the kingdom. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank You for this time and we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that it instructs and it guides us. Lord, we confess that we are so readily prone to distrust you and to rely on our wisdom. I pray for any who have strayed like Abraham did at the start and who didn't lean on you and who relied on wisdom and who walked by sight briefly. I pray that you would bring them back, give them a clear vision of Christ again, of him dying and rising for our sins that we might be saved. For any who are straying and living like Lot, walking by sight, I pray you may rescue them before devastation strikes and may you encourage them that mercy is readily available. The way back is always available. I pray that we may live lives that are marked by contentment, that we might walk by faith and not by sight because the day is coming when we truly will see and we'll see you face to face. But until then, God, help us to live trusting you. I pray these things. In the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. May the Lord bless each and every one of you.